Let us pray. Every praise is to our God. Words. But actually also needs to be a part of our life and how we think about you. Where we deal with the world that we live in. Not to remove you to the side, but to put you in the center of it all. Here we are in the presence of God Almighty. So easy to say, but so hard to imagine. That we can be in the presence of the one who created it all. That we can be in the presence of the God who made the things that surround us. That we can be in the presence of God, the eternal one. Thank you that you come. Every Sunday when we come to this building, we have determined the time you show up because that's your promise. You, sh you show up because you want to be involved in your lives. You show up because you know our hearts and you know our needs. You show up because you want to help us to deal with ourselves and with the life that we live in this world. And therefore, many times, somebody walks out and says, this was for me today. That is only possible because your Spirit is the one that speaks to us individually. I ask today, O oh Lord, that your Spirit will again move and will do the work that needs to be done. This is your office space. This is your workspace. Work in us and do with us what you know will serve you and your kingdom then the best. And use the words I need to share as words that will help us to understand your will for us. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> for Luis and I, it was the B.C. era. Before cell phones, before computers, before children, that we decided that we are going to backpack through Europe. And you can see there Luis is. She heard about backpacking through Europe. So, but that's now me, you know. So I also decided I had to take a few things with me on this journey of ours. We left with little money in our pockets, but with lots of great adventure in our hearts. And we traveled for six plus weeks through Europe, riding on trains, sleeping outside. It happens a few times, and sleeping in pensions and whatever. At the end of our journey, we ended up in Kirland, Germany, and we really had not that much money left, but we found this little boy, a small ornament that really spoke to us for some reason, this little Dutch boy standing there with a ball underneath his arm, and then with these wooden shoes, and it cost quite a lot of Deutsche Mark then before the Euro, and we sort of took all our money, and we bought this thing, and we brought it back home, and that became our most precious ornament that we have in our house. I asked Luis before I made the sermon, I said, Luisa, what's the most important thing we have in our house? And you see the little man standing there. And this little boy on the left-hand side of your screen, you'll see a few times we're on this smaller cabinet in our house until the children came. Then he went up high to the bigger one up there. And then as the kids grew older, they, we allowed this little boy to come down again. And then as we had grandchildren, guess what? He went all the, that's where he is now. Because he's not a toy. I said, Louise, I want to bring him to church. He said, no, leave him home. I'm just kidding. So when I thought about this whole idea, this little ornament in our house, and, and how precious the thing is to us, because in a way it represents that whole six weeks that we spent uh, when we were barely married uh, in Europe, I realized we were keeping this little thing separate from many other things in our house. And that's the word Holy. That's the word holy. You see, many times when we, when we read the Bible and you hear the word holy, you think that's now the time to run away. Because at some point God said, do not touch the mountain because you will die. So we thought, okay, holy means that you touch, you die. Moses walked towards this burning bush. God said to him, you are standing on holy ground. Now take off your shoes and then you can approach the bush. And then many times through the Bible, you'll find a reference to holy utensils in the tabernacle, all these kinds of things. And if you look at what the word in Hebrew actually means, it means 
to be set apart, to be different, to be special. It doesn't mean that you will be killed because something is holy. It just means it's different. And when God was on the mountain, He said, now this mountain is different because I'm as God are on this mountain. And therefore, don't touch it. Because it has nothing to do with the mountain. It has to do with me, and I'm special. I'm the only holy living God that's now in your presence. So holy only means, in a sense, <clears throat> set apart, different, and in a sense, also to be protected a little bit. You see, holy doesn't only apply to utensils and to a little ornament, in a sense. It's not that the thing is holy, but it's sort of special. It also applies to relationships. The moment when I'm married to couples in the church, and I've married countless of couples here in, in South Africa, in my church there, you know, we say it's a holy matrimony. It, it's, it's a holy ceremony. It's, it's a holy union that's taking place. So what makes my relationship with Louise holy? What makes it holy means that it's separate from other relationships. It means that it's different from other relationships. It means that it needs to be protected more than I protect other relationships that I have in my life because this relationship is different. It's in a sense holy. It's, it's separate from others. Now do I protect my relationship? I protect my relationship from, from within in the sense that I and she need to try to treat each other the best that we can because that's part of the protection shield that we build around it. But we also need to make sure that outside forces that constantly will play into a relationship will not destroy what we have. So it needs to be fenced in also in a way. The Heidelberg Catechism that I start off in the beginning of this year in January, now brought us to the most precious part, an intimate part of our walk with God. All of us sitting in this building have our journey with God. But what Heidelberg Catechism has done is it introduced us, introduced us to who we are, who God is, about you know, how God wants to journey with us, and now it brought us to that moment to say, okay, if you believe in God, what does it mean? It means that you do not believe in something or in a distant person somewhere, but you actually believe in someone that you can communicate with, that is so close that you can have a relationship with this God. And that is what faith means. Faith means that you and I say, I believe in God, but in such a way that this God is so close to me that I can talk to Him, because He also wants to talk to me. So if you ever hear somebody say, you need to accept Jesus as your own personal Lord and Savior, that's what it means. It just means that I believe that God is real. I believe God has a personality. I believe that God wants to talk to me, and God wants me to talk to Him. So faith has to do with this intimate side of communication, this, this contact between people, contact between me and God, who's a person that needs to take place. And last week, what the Heidelberg Catechism did was it brought us to the Lord's Prayer and said, okay, the first thing that we need to say is, or understand is that God is our Father. And I spoke about that last week. I'm not going to repeat what I said, but that we can actually say to God, as I said earlier, Daddy, that I can actually sit with God as a child, sit with an extremely loving, caring parent. And I tried to define last week what a biblical parent is, not some of those that you find now. But what the Heidelberg Catechism is doing now, it's leading us to the first petition. And, and the first petition, so my father who art in heaven, first petition, hallowed be thy name. Now the Harvard Catechism comes and explains to us what they think it means. That is, help us first of all to know the, thee rightly, and to hallow, hallow, glorify, and praise thee in all thy works, through which there shine thine almighty power, wisdom, goodness, righteousness, mercy, and truth. And so order our whole life in thought, word, and deed, that thy name may be never, never be blasphemed on our account, but may always be honored and praised. What makes this petition different from the Ten Commandments, where we said that the Lord said, don't use my no name in vain, is that this petition has to do not really with the name of God, but with the person of God. You see, in the Old Testament times, and even in the New Testament times, your name was you. Your name identified your personality. It many times had a meaning that said something about yourself. And now, now God comes and He says, 
when you say, I am your father, I want you to think about who I am and this relationship that you have with me that also then needs to be protected. It needs to be dealt with differently. Like holy. That's how it should be dealt with. So where do I place God in my life? If I now need to think about God and what's his place in my life, because I'm saying in this prayer, I'm going to make you special. I'm going to make you different in my world. Where am I going to place him? So I found this triangle. The priorities of Christian life. And it's not the best, but I found this one. So at the bottom it says ministry. Now, now please ignore that word for a moment because that word ministry actually means your involvement in this world. It has to do with all our actual day-to-day -day living that they, these guys called ministry because wherever you go, shopping, whatever, it's part of a Christian's ministry, right? Then your occupation, that's your work, then your children, then your spouse, then God. And, that's, and, and, and it's well. It's well done. It's how it should be. So if I look at my life, all the other things are at the bottom, and then it's um, my work, and then it's my children, and then my spouse, and then it's God. Cool, that's how it should be. God should be at the top of everything in my life. He should have the first place. And we also know that if you mix this up, you put God at the bottom, and you have different things, like on top, watching sport or cooking shows. You know, I, I know, you know, that cooking show thing. Occupation, involvement in the world, spouse, children, all of these things are now a little bit more different. This thing can't stand. It will fall over. It will twist. It, it will, you can't put that thing, you understand. So I many times in my life have used this as an illustration to say to people, well, God needs to be at the top of your life. He needs to be at the top of the triangle. If you put him at the bottom, he's the least important in your life, your life will start to fall apart because that's what this diagram tells you. If you put God at the bottom, bottom, then nothing will work well in your life. But is this a good way of looking at where I need to place God in my life? When I looked at this again, I realized, but there's something wrong with this whole thing. Because here at the bottom, it's my life in this world, and it has to do with my work and my children, whatever, and then God is there. And that's the idea that many people have. They have this idea that God is here. You see, this building is almost like a triangle. God's at the top. He's in the, this building. So I come to visit God with respect on the sun. They're like, I've got someone in a nursing home, and I go to visit that person, or in the hospital. Not well, you understand what I'm trying to say. So I come and I visit with God on this Sunday, and this is my worship space, and I worship time, and that's what I do here. But when I leave here with respect, God stays behind, and I go and do my life. That's how this can be interpreted. And then during my week, I have a moment in the morning where I have this little triangle. That's now my God time. I pray. I read my Bible. I think about God. I meditate for a moment. But then when I close my Bible and I put my Bible down, then... I continue with the rest. So I gave it some thought. The strongest structure that you can find in the world is a triangle. A triangle. If you would crawl into your attic in your, in your roof, every single one of you, what will you find? A lot of trusses. And all of them are triangles. Triangle, triangle after triangle. If you look at the structure, it's triangle and triangle because a triangle can't really be pushed in. It's the strongest thing that you can actually build. In this picture of mine, there's a triangle, but I thought there's a different triangle also, and that's the triangle with respect of God. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Father, and you know how that works in the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to speak about the, the, the triunity now. But I thought, so we have actually a triangle with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit involved in each other, but also with us. Maybe if I say the prayer, Lord, hallowed be thy name. Maybe I should think about my life as this. Now, I try to change this triangle with adding my colors. Where the top is not where God is, but God is all around this thing. God actually then becomes the triangle. I place God as the triangle that surrounds every single part of my life. Because if I do this, then I will have the strength to withstand what this world brings to me every moment of every day. This means then that 
I need to allow God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to be involved in my day-to-day living, in my work with my children, my spouse, and then also in my worship time. But God is not only ex- he's not excluded from the rest, but He's included in all of this. How do I practically then do this? If I pray the Lord's Prayer and I say, Hallowed be thy name. I'm saying, Lord, I want to make your person, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, special in my life. I want to treasure it, but I also know I need to protect it. And the first thing that I need to protect is my faith in you. And that's the huge issue. We live now in a world that people are trying to convince you and me not to believe in God. We live in a world where they constantly are trying to convince us that all the information that we have about God is wrong. Louise said to me now recently, suddenly there are all of these bestsellers on Amazon. And she says to me, listen to the titles. All the titles is the 10 myths about Christianity that you now need to know. The 15 things about Christianity that debunks the whole faith. There are all of these things. And they all come out of California, now they've got some storms. I blow, uh, they are praying today. I, uh, they are praying today. That's what they probably need to do. And all the guys' first names are David. I don't know why, but okay. David, biblical name, but they all are against him. I don't know, but let them pray. The, the long and the short is that there will be an attack on your faith and my faith every single day. Hallowed be thy name. I need to protect my faith. We many times think the fact that you sit in church and you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior means that you are now fine. You are not. You are saved, but you are not fine. Because this world is going to try to steal it from you and take it from you and from me also. The Bible tells me I need to be alert. The Bible tells me I almost need to be like a lion. The Bible tells me that I can't really ever relax as a Christian. Because I've got something that's very special that the world doesn't want me to have, and that's my faith. I, I'm always so surprised. Why don't they leave us alone? What have I done that they need to come after me because I believe in Jesus? It is as if the world can't leave us alone. Um, I, 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 let, me, let me tell you this. There's a person that, uh, that's somewhere who's divorced. And this person decided to this almost start a ministry. I can't call it a ministry, a uh, something. To help people to get divorced. To tell them that if you are not really happy in your relationship, that's what you should do. That is the solution. And this person actually was the reason that a person found its way or their way into my office. And I said, to help me in... And the lady said, well, th- according to that one, that's the answer for us. Is, this is because it's a blessing. It's wonderful to be divorced. And I sat there and I thought for myself, why would you, if you are divorced, try to destroy other relationships? Because the biblical solution is to try to restore, not to destroy. And I thought to myself, that's true of faith also. Because people do not believe in Jesus, they will come after me because I believe they want to destroy what I have because they don't have it. And they think they are saving me. From what? I do not know. But they won't leave me alone. And that's why the media and the world around us constantly will come after your faith. And constantly will try to convince you that what you and I believe is not the truth. Hallowed be thy name, Lord, help me that I will protect my faith in you, in who you are, because the world will come after me. It's like any relationship, the attack will come from the outside, but also from the inside. I need to protect God's place in my life. You know, C.S. Lewis wrote this book, The Screwtape Letters, and uh, Wormwood is this, is this guy that's now coming to Satan to find out, how can he do Satan's work for him? And you know what Satan says to him? You don't need to tempt them. You don't need to, to stop doing all of these things that you think will get them away from Jesus. Just keep them busy. Keep them busy. They don't have time to pray, don't have time to read their Bibles or go to church. Keep them busy. That's all you need to do. Because as you keep them busy, 
the place that God has in their lives will start to slip away and disappear in the background, and eventually it will become a common thing. Not a holy thing anymore, a special thing anymore. Keep them busy. Make sure all the children are having all these sport events on Sundays. Make sure that all the main things that people want to attend are now on Sundays, not on Saturdays anymore, now on the Sunday, because it's irrelevant that churches want to have worship. Keep them busy. Protect the value of God's Word in your life. Why is this? This book is not that heavy as you think it is. You can really pick it up. <laughs> Why is it so heavy to pick up this? Sorry, my Bible is not in good shape. Um, why is it so heavy to pick up this book and read it? Even I, sometimes when I see a novel lying and I need to fly, I, I rather take a storybook than I sometimes would read my Bible. Because I want to go into that world that's a fantasy world. The Bible is not always a fantasy world, very real. Lord, hallowed be thy name. Lord, may your person and your word be valued by me, protected by me that I've designated times that I will read my Bible. And I know it's a, it's, it's, it, if you look at this thing, you say, where do I start? You start and you read. There are 66 books. It's a library. Just choose one. John, Matthew, Mark, start in the New Testament. John 1 verse 1. Start in the beginning. Don't just let it fall open and say, okay, I'm going to read here. It won't, won't make any sense. Start in the beginning like you would read any book. That's what hallowed be thy name means. Is to protect what God gives me. Let me continue. Remember the story behind it. That's why I've got a picture of Jesus. Now, Luis and I were walking last week or the week before. I can't remember. And, and we were talking about these things. And he said to me, it's the strangest story, isn't it? That God would send God to this world. It's a strange story. But it's a fascinating story. There's no other religion with our story. There's no other religion ever that has this story. In the mythologies, you have some things like this a little bit, but it's confusing and it's crazy and all full, full of rubbish. But the simplicity of the story of Christ has never existed and will never exist. And one of these guys that, also, that now wrote the bestseller, he says in his own book, he can't understand why this person who doesn't believe in that, he says didn't even exist, could have a following of Billions of people over 2,000 years. He says, I can't understand. Well, I, I can tell him because he's an idiot and, and God is there. <laughs> this is an amazing story. And I remind myself of this story frequently. That there was someone that walked on this earth. I mean, I look at the world around me and I turn on the news and I, and I look at, you know, people are still the same as they, what's the time now? Oh, I've got time. I'll be done before Thanksgiving, I promise you. Okay. People have not yet really changed. Our food, different. Our clothing looks different. But people are somewhat the same than they were when Jesus walked on this earth. Cultures were different, but who we are didn't change. Crime, time of Jesus. Really mean and, 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 and cruel people, time of Jesus. Great, good people, time of Jesus. Didn't believe in God, time of Jesus. All the things that you and I are exposed to existed in the time of our living Lord when he walked the dust of this earth. It's the coolest thing to have a chat with him every day. If you drive and a guy does something wrong, I say, Lord, did you see this? That's the only thing you didn't see. Ah, when you were here, you didn't see these drivers on I-4. That's what you missed out on. But Lord, you know, you've been here. You know how irritating it is to be exposed to people that has no value of who I am, of my life, or whatever. The Lord knows this. Lord, hallowed be thy name. Help me to remember your story. An amazing story. Almost done. Resist a world that has no value for what is sacred to us. That little stupid ornament of ours, it's just an ornament. It's not a toy. <laughs> it's not a toy. You see, the moment when it becomes a toy, it, it will be broken. It will not have its little place, and, and it will lose its meaning in a sense to us. 
The world doesn't always attack what we have to try to take it away. They come to us and try to change it. And that's what you will find in this modern Christian world a little bit. That many churches will come and take the sacredness, the specialness of God away and make Him so common that He's not special anymore. He's not the only holy living God that has standards and ethical codes and whatever. He's just one of us that's so happy with what we do because he's just thinking it's the coolest thing to live your life as you please to do so. And that becomes the God that people want to follow now. A God that has no issue with who you are. You never need to say you are sorry to. Fall on your knees and say, I'm a sinner too. Of course, you don't even need to talk about sin before this God because He's so cool with everything. A cool Jesus, a cool God, a common God with respect, and a common Jesus who became a toy in the hands of people. Apply the person and the will of God to everything in your life. Everything. I can't just be a Christian in church. I need to be a Christian at home with my family, with my spouse, with my children. I need to try to be a Christian on the roads and drive very safely. They saw in the church, I cut off once. There she sits. Yeah, I didn't see him this morning. <laughs> but I need to drive. That's why I don't have a fish on the back of my car. I don't want to, yeah. They speak not on Luisa's car. No, 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 no fish. <laughs> because he drives fast. Um, <laughs> hey, yeah, yeah. Let's not go there. Protect, apply God's person in all I am. Lord, hallowed be thy name. Let everything about you soak through every facet of my life. I can't pick and choose. I can't say this part of the Bible, that's, that's good, that, you, that's for you. This part, maybe it's for me because it says the Lord will save me. That part, mm, that's for you because mm, everything is for me. Everything. Bring glory and praise to him in all and for all. That's what the Albert Catechism also ends up, up with that answer of theirs. Why are we not enjoying life more? You know, I said to someone recently, and I many times during weddings would tell the story of people that think that, always say this, this little girl that saw a donkey and she asked her parents, is that donkey a Christian? And she said, they said, why would you ask that? And he said, because, and she said, because the donkey looks so sad. And that's the problem that many people think, that if you are a Christian, you need to have this sad life because you're missing out on all the fun and... Fun and what? Tell me what is it that the world can bring that can replace what you have in Jesus. All of the rubbish out there is great. You can enjoy it and I can enjoy it, but if that's the purpose of your life, you have no life. You have no life. So at the end of the day, is we need to be joyful. I need to, when I wake up, be thankful for what I've got. Lord, hallowed be thy name. Thank you that you as a person are involved in my life, that you gave us what we have, and live with a smile. Live with joy in your heart because you're not alone. You've got a dad that walks with you. And he says, because you're important to me, I just ask of you as you go along with respect, also protect my person and my value in your life, because the world are going to try and steal it, but don't let him take it away, because, man, we are having so much fun, father and child. Second last slide, lift, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made the heaven and the earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Who keeps us all will neither slumber or sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. Sun shall not strike you by day. The moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. Will keep your life. The Lord will keep you going out. You're coming in. From this time on forevermore. Jerusalem surrounded by hills. Where will my help come from? My help comes from the one who's part of my world. And when I get lost, look at the hills. No, look at the Lord, the triangle of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that surrounds your life and my life. The strongest possible structure there to protect you and me, to keep us safe from a world that wants to steal our joy and our faith. 
fence. You can see through, but it's still a fence. Because what's inside needs to be protected from what's outside, and sometimes what's inside needs to be kept inside. That's what this prayer means. This is what this prayer means. Lord, may, that, may, may my relationship with you be fenced in so that it will never lose its meaning and its value for who you are. Amen.